For the first four years, when running this channel and working with microcontrollers, I stuck to regular Arduino boards like Uno and Nano. Staying with popular Arduino microcontrollers, I was in my comfort zone. And I thought that working with anything else would be too much effort. What I didn't realize is that ESP microcontrollers offer so much more resources and the best part is you can program them from within Arduino IDE. So if you are still stuck in Arduino only world, don't make the same mistake I did. Step out into the world of other microcontrollers, starting with ESP family. Let's quickly review the Arduino family of microcontrollers. The classic choice was the Arduino Uno, followed by the smaller Nano. There were also variations like RF Nano with a radio interface or the Pro Mini which ran at 3.3 volts instead of 5 volts. If you needed more pins, the Mega was the go-to, but all of these lacked Wi-Fi and had pretty limited resources. To address that, Arduino released the Uno Revision 4 Wi-Fi with the built-in Wi-Fi and more power. It was supposed to replace the old Unos, but compatibility issues with libraries make me doubt that will ever happen. Now compare that to ESP boards. The ESP8266 is faster, has Wi-Fi on board and way more memory. The Wemos D1 is its compact version kind of like the Nano in the ESP world. And then there is ESP32, even faster, with more resources and available in many versions, like this one, with the built-in camera. Honestly, most of my projects work fine with ESP8266 and Wemos, so I haven't used ESP32 much yet. But if you compare both families, it's no contest. ESP boards are miles ahead. Let's take a closer look. Let's look at the pinout of the ESP8266, placed side by side with the very familiar Arduino Uno. The first thing that catches my eye is the built-in Wi-Fi capability right there on the chip. Now let's dive into the detailed pinout for this ESP board. Straight off the bat, a very interesting observation. In the pinout diagram, the pins are labeled using GPIO numbers. The ESP8266 itself only knows those GPIO numbers, it has no concept of D0, D1 and so on. But on the actual board you don't see those GPIO numbers at all. Instead, the silk screen only shows the familiar labels like D0, D1 and so on that you know from Arduino. This tells us that the board was designed with the Arduino IDE environment in mind. Of course, ESP boards also have their own native development tools. Let's have a quick look at them. Gee, I wonder why people go with Arduino IDE. Only selected GPIO pins can be used for input and output. And here they are. Notably, there is just one analog input pin, which accepts a voltage range from 0 to 1 volts. Some boards extend that to 0 to 3 volts, but make sure before applying any voltage. These input and output pins are equivalent to Arduino Uno pins, though the Uno is much better in the analog department. Some GPIO pins have special functions, just like on the Arduino. For example, two pins are reserved for I2C interface, similar to A4 and A5 on the Uno. There are two separate SPI buses as opposed to a single SPI bus on the Uno. And finally, we have two pins for UART, just like D0 and D1 on the UNO. With this, we are only scratching the surface of the ESP8266 capabilities. This microcontroller offers much more. More pins with PWM, pulse width modulation, more pins with interrupt support, and many other powerful features. But we'll cover those in detail later in this video. Last thing worth mentioning are the options for powering the ESP8266 board. Of course we have the USB port, but there is also the VIN pin. I have read that it supports voltages from, from 5 to 12 volts, though I haven't tested those extreme myself. When I use this VIN pin I usually go with 9 volt power adapter and that has always worked fine for me. You cannot power the board through 3 volt pins. Let's breeze through the pinout of the Wemos D1. As I mentioned earlier, it's a compact version of ESP8266, so it exposes fewer GPIO pins 
for input and output. It also includes I2C pins, SPI pins and pins for serial communication. The main difference here is that Wemos D1 does not have a VIN pin. Instead it provides 5V pin which can be used to power the board as an alternative to the USB port. Now let's look at the pinout of the ESP32 board. Where do we start? First of all the ESP32 uses native GPIO labels. You will notice it has many more input output pins than the ESP8266. You will also find I2C, two separate SPI buses and two pairs of serial interface pins. All GPIO output support PWM and many of them can also read analog input. Some pins even support a touch interface meaning you don't need external touch sensors to add touch functionality to your projects. There are also two DAC ports these support digital to analog conversions allowing the board to output a real voltage signal from 0 to 3 volts instead of just using PWM. All input pins are interrupt capable as well. Again there is a VIN pin which I assume requires a voltage between 5 and 12 volts. I made a statement that ESP boards have much more resources. Let's take a closer look at how big that gap really is. Starting with processor. Arduino runs on an 8-bit chip at just 16 MHz. The ESP8266 is a big step up with a 32-bit core running at up to 160 and the ESP32 takes it even further, a dual-core processor clocked as high as 240 MHz. Memory. Flash is where your program code lives. On Arduino Uno or Nano you only get 32 kilobytes of flash. Tiny, just enough for simple sketches. The ESP8266 jumps way ahead with around 4 megabytes of flash storage. And the ESP32 can pack even more, usually 4 to 16 megabytes, giving you space for large applications and over the air updates. Now let's look at SRAM. The working memory your code uses while running. Arduino gives you only 2 kilobytes of SRAM, which fills up fast with variables, arrays or strings. The ESP8266 offers about 80 kilobytes usable, a big step forward but still limited for heavy tasks. The ESP is the real powerhouse with over 500 kilobytes of SRAM and some boards even add extra external RAM for complex projects. Let's look at connectivity. Arduino boards don't come with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth built-in. The ESP8266 adds Wi-Fi support right on the chip and the ESP32 brings both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth including low energy making it perfect for connected devices. Pins. The Arduino Uno or Nano gives you around 20 input and output pins including 6 analog. It offers PWM on a handful of them and only two pins support interrupts. The ESP8266 has fewer, about 11 usable pins with just one analog input. Wemos D1 has even smaller number. PWM is available on most pins and more pins support interrupts. The ESP shines here, offering roughly 30 pins, up to 18 analog channels, plenty of PWM outputs and nearly all GPIO pins support interrupts. Let's look at communication interfaces. Arduino keeps it simple. One hardware serial port plus I2C and SPI. The ESP8266 adds Wi-Fi and keeps the basics. UART, software I2C, SPI and one analog to digital converter input. The ESP is the feature powerhouse offering nearly every connectivity option you can think of for a small microcontroller including multiple UARTs, hardware I2C and SPI buses, CAN, touch sensors and more. Power. Arduino draws very little, just tens of milliamps. The ESP8266 is more demanding, especially when Wi-Fi is active, peaking up to 400 milliamps, but it can slip down to microamps. The ESP32 uses even more when active, up to 500 milliamps, but like the ESP8266, it supports deep sleep for ultra low power operation. So let's summarize. Arduino is a simple and effective for basic projects. 
ESP8266 is the budget choice for Wi-Fi connected projects. The ESP32 is the powerhouse, combining speed, memory and connectivity in one chip. The Arduino IDE on my computer is already configured for ESP boards, so let's do a brand new installation on another computer. This is the new version of IDE that I haven't worked with before. I am not sure I like the new look. If you go to the board selection, you will see only the usual Arduino boards, Uno, Nano, Mega among them. You won't find any ESP boards here. You will also most likely not find ESP boards packages in the board manager. To make them visible, go to File, Preferences and look for the field called Additional Board Manager URLs. Here enter the link to the JSON file containing the ESP8266 family of boards. If you want to install ESP32 instead, use a different URL. When you confirm, the installation process will begin. Once it's complete, go to the board manager, search for the ESP8266 package and install it. It takes a while. Now, when you return to the board selection, you will see the whole new family of boards available. To work with the ESP8266 board, select the appropriate entry from the list. Then connect the board to your computer and select the proper port in the Arduino IDE. With that done, we can test the board with the simplest sketch possible, the blink sketch. You can find it in the list of examples provided in the Arduino IDE. I'll resize the window so it's easier to see the upload log. Let's also remove the descriptive comments at the top of the code. The last thing we need to do is to change the LED pin. We won't be using the onboard LED. Instead, I've connected a small LilyPad LED close to the microcontroller with one side going to ground and the other to pin D7. One very important detail. When referring to pin D7, it must be written as D7 in the code. You cannot use numeric value 7 like you would on a standard Arduino board. If you do, it would refer to GPIO7 on the ESP, which is a completely different pin. Let's start the upload. The sketch is compiled first. The first compilation for ESP boards takes a long time, but subsequent ones are much quicker. The upload has now started and as you can see the process is reported a bit differently compared to the regular Arduino boards. Once it finishes, the LED should start blinking. Let's wait for it. And it does. For the second code example, I wanted to create a code that connects and pulls data from the Internet. But a sketch like this would be too complex to explain in a reasonable time frame in this video. So instead, in coming days, I'm going to release two videos covering two IoT projects like this. One showing creation of the clock that synchronizes time with the Internet and doesn't require real-time clock module. And the other one would be a quote display that fetches quotes from famous people online. This project is ready, I just need more time to record and showcase it. If you can't wait, you can check out my two IoT projects that already have videos. One for displaying stock quotes and another for showing cryptocurrency prices. So today, instead of creating IoT sketch, I decided to look more closely at the touch interface, the feature I didn't even know existed before I started working on this project. In the past, I created a video about touch sensors, which is one of my most popular videos, so hopefully you will find this segment interesting as well. The goal here is to use the ESP plus a piece of aluminum foil acting as a capacitive touchpad connected to GPIO pin 33 to control a small LilyPad LED which is connected between ground and GPIO pin 26. If it works, the LED should light up each time we touch the pad. Now, do we need to do anything special in the code to make that happen? Let's take a look. First, we declare the pins. Wait, what on earth is pin 
T8. Let's check the pinout again. Here it is, GPIO 33. As you can see, it corresponds to touch channel T8. The LED pin simply refers to its GPIO number. From here, the code is straightforward. In the setup function, we declare the LED pin as output, and in the loop, we use touch read to read a value from the pin. That value will differ slightly between controllers, but for my board, a threshold value of 30 works fine. If the reading falls below 30, we turn the LED on. If it's above 30, we turn it off. Here is the setup for this project. Here is a capacitive pad. As you can see, it's connected to GPIO pin 33. The LED is connected to GPIO pin 26 on a positive side, with a negative side going to ground. Let's power up the microcontroller and open Arduino IDE. To make the Arduino IDE recognize the ESP32 family of boards, go to Preferences. Here you can see the JSON file we previously used to install the ESP8266 family. Now we'll need to use this JSON file for the ESP32 instead. I won't run the installation again, since I have already done it. Once the installation is complete, go to the board manager. You should be able to scroll down and find the ESP32 package available for installation. Here it is. Since it's already installed on my setup, I won't reinstall it. Now we can finally select our board. Based on the label on the board, I will choose ESP32 Rover Kit entry. Let's hope this is the correct one. Let's expand the status window to see the upload progress. We are ready. Let's upload the code. It's compiling. So far so good. And now the upload has started. You'll notice the upload report looks a bit different from the one we saw on the ESP8266. The code is loaded. Let's test it. And it works. How about that? ESP32 provides nine pins that support touch interface. That's all for this video. Don't forget to like it if you enjoyed it. Huge thanks to all my patrons, channel members and other people supporting my channel through PayPal or Coffee. Compiling the list of all of you is becoming a challenge. I'll see you guys in my next video. Ciao.